Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here for my regular Monday this and that video where I talk about many different topics. A lot of times, like I'm gonna be doing today, I'm addressing questions that have come in in the past week, giving you updates of different experiments I have going on, letting you know of videos I have coming out or videos I already have out that I'll be linking you back to. So let's get to the topics of today. Now, one question I got a lot because of the baking powder video that came out is where do I get these jars? I got purple and I've got green. Well, these I bought years ago when they were first released by Ball. And these were the Heritage Collection. The first color they came out with was the blue. It's almost a turquoise blue, really pretty but I don't do a lot of decorating with those colors in my home. Mostly I use green, darker like denim type blues and darker reds like burgundy. And on occasion, a little bit of purple like here in the kitchen. So what happened was, I, I can't remember what year it was, but each year Ball released a different colored jar. So they started with the blue, then they came out with the green, which is the one I had to have. Then they came out with the purple. Now, when they were first released, they were $10, at least at our local store, $10 for a pack of six pint jars. And I don't remember how much the quart jars were. I think I might've bought some green ones in quarts, but mostly I went for pints. Some of them were to use like I'm using these and some were to use as drinking glasses. Unfortunately, they're not making them anymore. They were a limited time thing. So just like anything that was limited, it was a good price when it first came out, but if you go to try to find them now, you can pay as much as $100 for a six pack of pint jars. Now, one thing I wanna mention before I move on to the next topic is that when it comes to colored jars and you're using them for food, you gotta really be careful of the ones you get. Those cheaper ones that are made in China are usually painted with some kind of toxic paint and they're not supposed to be used with food. <laughs> but now the lids, like this same thing i get asked this question a lot and i did do a video just on these that i'll link to down below but i went back to this place it was called candle solutions i'll also put a link to that and it looks like they're going to be phasing these ones out now these are also supposed to be only for decorative the difference with the lids is there's things you can do to make them food safe which i cover in that video so if you're interested in that and you're able to get lids like this then you might want to go check that out to see some of the different things you can do to make those lids food safe. And I just like the way they look. So anything that's on, that's going to be out on the counter, like some of my herbs I have back here for teas or these, the sugars and the baking powder and cream of tartar that I have out here. I like to have these nicer looking lids than just regular canning jar lids. So now let's talk more about the baking powder. So that video just came out and I, I had updated how I do the baking powder, and that is simply keeping the ingredients separately, separate because it really doesn't take but maybe another second or two more to take two teaspoons of the baking soda and one teaspoon of the cream of tartar. And I don't have to add any kind of starch. Well, I wanted to address a couple of questions in regards to that, as well as something that I forgot to say in that video, that one of the things about, if you're one, that is like us, you're, you're more into preparedness and putting up for hard times or when certain things are not available, such as baking powder. So you're wanting to stock up on baking powder. Instead of buying baking powder pre-made in bulk, you'd be better off buying your ingredients separately, your cream of tartar and your baking soda and storing them separately because they're going to hold up in storage a lot longer, well pretty much indefinitely, if you keep them separate. But once they're combined, even with some kind of starch to keep them from clumping, it'll start to, it's not that it's gonna spoil, it'll start to lose its potency over time. And it's because of the acid and the base being combined. Again, think about what happens when you combine vinegar and baking soda together. Eventually there's like nothing left because it all foams out. So same basic principle. So if you're stocking up, the best way to go about it is store them separately. Then a question I kept getting was, well, if you're going to go ahead and mix it and have a pre-mix batch, again, I would say only pre-mix a certain amount of time, like maybe a pint jar 
or a quart tops at a time, then you have to add a starch. Now, I specifically said starches like tapioca and arrowroot because those are the ones I use. I do not use cornstarch. I used to, but I don't use it at all anymore because it's one of those that's hard to find that's non-GMO where it's really easy for me to get a good deal on organic tapioca starch or arrowroot powder. But yes, you can use cornstarch. I just highly recommend you look for one that is organic and non-GMO. And then some people just have corn allergies. They have to avoid corn altogether. So going with the tapioca or the arrowroot is a better option. That's again, only if you're going to pre-mix your baking powder. So if you want more information on how to do that, please go check out that video and I'll link to it in the description box down below. Now let's talk about a little bit about lids. So another question I've been getting a lot lately again is how do you open your lids, especially the metal lids. So when you're talking about vacuum sealing dried goods like I have here into a jar and you're going to open the lids and maybe you want to reseal that jar because you're only going to take out a little bit such as something like this where I've got the dehydrated ham pieces in here or the dehydrated beef pieces. This is something you'd want to vacuum seal between uses because of what it is. So the question I get was can I reuse that lid? Yes you can. In fact all of my lids like this have been reused. They've either lids that I've used for pressure canning or water bath canning that I've washed up and then reused for dehydrated goods that I've then reused again and again and again. I The only time I stop using them is when they just get too bent up and they're, they just won't seal anymore. But the question that I get is, well, how do you open them without destroying them? What do you use? Well, I just use this. This thing's probably about 50, 60 years old now. It's just a classic can slash bottle opener like this. What you need is this side right here. And you can see a video clip right here of me opening a Tatler lid. So I use the same thing for the Tatler lid as I do for the metal lids. Now, when I got my last batch of Tatler lids, I did end up getting, this isn't the one that looks just like this, a, a lid opener just like this. And some people seem to think that one works better. I don't know why I find this this one much better because it's wider. That means I'm less likely to cause damage to the lid when I go to open it. So just look for a classic bottle opener like this. That's all you need. It, the what, three, four bucks? And, and just be careful when you go to open it. Don't just yank on it real hard. Just open it slowly and then you're going to be less likely to dent the top. But really, if you put the dent anywhere in this part of the lid, as long as you don't poke a hole in it, it's not going to hurt the lid. It's when you damage or bend up the, this rim right here. That's the part you have to watch for. Because if that gets bent, you're not going to be able to good, get a good seal. So moving on, I haven't vacuum sealed this yet because this was, um, we don't eat a lot of pork products. And in fact, I haven't cooked up a ham in at least 10 years. I did finally cook up a spiral ham that I got from our butcher box. And it was, it was a nice change because we haven't done that in so long. Well, we had our friends over, so I made up the whole ham. And then I took the leftovers and decided to go ahead and try, since I've been dehydrating so many meats lately, try dehydrating up the ham and it turned out really good. It actually turned out pretty crispy. And the only thing I haven't done though yet is try rehydrating it. So I had, I did just get a comment, just so happened it came in this morning before shooting this video about a lady that tried dehydrating the ham and she tried soaking it, I think in just basically room temperature water for 20 minutes. And she said it was still hard. Um, I would imagine it's probably gonna be similar to chicken or turkey. But my goal, what I'm gonna try with this at least once to see if it works, is to throw it into, with the beans, when I go to cook the beans, and because you know I usually cook them for a day, even two days, for making the beans and cornbread that I did a video on that I'll also link to down below. It's just throwing a handful in with that so it's gonna keep cooking and it's gonna be hot. And I think it should rehydrate pretty well. If not, at least it's going to add some more flavor to the beans and cornbread, and then I'll know. So once I do that, I don't know when I'm going to do that again, but once I do that, I'll give you an update. And if it doesn't work out, well, I tell you what, this stuff is really great for snacking on. It tastes a lot like unsalted bacon is what it tastes like. And then as far as the beef goes, well, this is, some of you know I've been taking some of my 
beef that I'd canned going, going back to the stuff that's been canned for the longest, which is from 2015 and trying to get that used up so I can get fresh stuff back in my pantry. And one of the things I've been doing is dehydrating it, powdering up it and using it for baby food and the baby loves it. But this time what I did was I took this just basically straight out of the jar and drained all the liquid off of it and then just pressed it out you know, broke it up into as small as pieces as I could and then put it on the dehydrating trays and then dried it up. It dried up beautifully, nice and crisp. And again, this is very delicious right out of the jar. And I'm thinking since this was pressure canned initially, it probably, it should rehydrate quite well if I decide to add it to soups and stuff. So initially I was gonna powder this up to have more of the beef powder, but I decided I wanna leave some like this. And then with that in mind, especially with this ham, you can look close, this has got, um, you can see fat in there. And some people concern themselves uh, probably a little too much about the fat, I understand. People are worried about the fat going rancid, but I wanna remind people yet again that when you, if you have fat in any of your meat, if you vacuum seal it, that's gonna prevent that fat from going rancid. And especially if you keep it in a cooler, the coolest part of your house, that will also help prevent it from going rancid. Just think of all the fats that you might already store. Some people store a bucket of lard. I've had a bucket of lard that I use for soap making that it's never gone rancid. And I've had it for years and it has not gone rancid. And that's not doing anything special with it. But when you're talking about something like this, especially when you're putting up meat, which is expensive, and you're wanting it to last long term, vacuum sealing will prevent that from going, the fat from going rancid. And I can say this from experience as well as my own research. But the, the main thing I wanted to address is the question I get about when people are dehydrating things like the chicken sausage slices that I have another video out on, or their eggs and they see the surface of the eggs, you know, when they're, before they try to powder it up or break it up and they can see it's, it's got an oily layer on it. Well, that's what you have to expect. I, I think a lot of times people expect that oil is going to dehydrate the way everything else does, and it doesn't. Oil will never dehydrate. It just doesn't dry. So you gotta expect there's gonna be oil on there. So if you're not removing all the fat and oils from your meats and whatever, then that's just something you're gonna to have to come to expect. I don't worry about it, especially with the eggs. I just leave that oil on there. Now, now, like I said in the egg dehydrating video, if you want to, you can blot a lot of that fat off the top layer before you powder it up. I don't because there's flavor in that and there's nutrients in that, so I leave the fat in there. Some things like when I'm doing ground beef, I do still drain most of that fat out, but I don't, hot water rinse it out like I did initially with my first batch or my second batch it was. And I did that and then I didn't like it. It didn't taste near as good as the stuff that I at least left some fat in. And then this just came in and I wasn't initially gonna talk about it, but I thought I would. I actually thought this, this felt like clothing before I opened this package up. Well, it's my mullen leaf because now I'm starting to use it on a regular basis and so I ran out of the little bit that my friend had given me and my mullet, I never was able to get it to grow last year. I'm trying again this year though, but until then I wanted to at least have some on hand and this is a pound. So that's why the bag is so big because mullen leaf is, it's like marshmallow leaf or lamb's ear leaf. It's very uh, fluffy and so it takes up a lot of space, very lightweight. Anyway, so I got that for making some teas and breaking that up with other teas like nettle leaf tea and um, the horsetail and the comfrey. So those are the four main different teas and I'll add spices. And yes, I'll add nutmeg because it is healthy for you and it's not gonna kill you if you use it in moderation. Good grief, people, stop freaking out about the nutmeg. So anyway, back to the topic was, um, I just wanted to bring this thing up about the tea. So I've been doing that to help heal my knee. If you watch my my last, last week's this and that video that I know that I damaged the ACL in my left knee, which yes, anterior cruciate ligament is what that is. So all, I'm trying to, I'm throwing everything at it that I can to help it heal up. And I do have a video coming out in a few weeks about joint health in general, where I talk about these different herbs and how they can help, but other things that you can do. So if you have osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or any issues with the cartilage, tendons, or ligaments in your joints, 
I have a video coming out on that. But coming back to the tea, I want to remind people that even though I don't have any written recipes on tea, and the reason I don't is because I just throw it together. It's, it could be a little bit different every time. But I have several videos I've done on different tea blends that I might be doing at the time and just show you how to do it. And the whole idea with those is making them to suit you. Anyway, I've never followed anyone's recipe for tea. I've always made up my own all the time. And I like to switch it up every day, which I think is especially important when you're talking about things that, yes, can be toxic in high quantities. I like to switch it up or can have certain other, like mullein leaf, for instance, this would be a good one for someone with hyperthyroidism. But if you have hypothyroidism or you're more prone to have a sluggish thyroid, then it's not something you're gonna to wanna to use every day. I feel safe enough using it, especially since I'm mixing it up with the nettle on other days, which is good for helping to boost the thyroid. And so that's why I won't have mullein tea every single day is because I don't want it to slow down my thyroid again. It probably wouldn't, but just to be on the safe side there, I just keep switching it. And that's how we should look at, a, at all herbs and spices. We shouldn't find ourselves becoming dependent on one to be a cure-all for everything. I don't care if it is called a cure-all like black seed and so on. Too much black seed can be detrimental to your health too. Anything can be detrimental to your health if not used in moderation. I don't care what it is. So I keep saying that because I need to keep reminding people because there's always going to be that one or two persons that come in there because one person said, oh, I heard nutmeg was toxic. Um, yeah, in high quantities. And that means like if you're eating spoonfuls of it every single day, though I'd still say break it up a little bit, you know, maybe have nutmeg this day or maybe a few days in a row and then next day make your tea with something else and don't put nutmeg in it just keep it mixed up that's what i always do even with the safest herbs out there i still don't like peppermint peppermint is pretty safe and it's one of my favorite teas i don't drink peppermint tea every single day because i can tell when it's starting to have a detrimental effect on my di digestion isn't that funny because peppermint can be good for digestion, but on the other hand, it can be so powerful at helping to kill bacteria and, and more that too much can eventually be detrimental to your gut health. So mix things up, just moderation. Don't be afraid of something just because somebody, just because one person said so. That's why learning how to do your own research is so very important. And I just seems like I can't say that one enough. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, by the way, is I'm gonna link down below to my full playlist on teas and infusions. So if you just wanna get some ideas of different types of ways that you can blend herbs and spices to make a tea that is useful to you or the one that you just enjoy drinking or one that you're just taking to help boost your health, then you can get some ideas from there. But remember, just be creative and, and try to find ways to make your own blends that are gonna suit you and your needs. And then, as I said, keep it mixed up and don't, don't use any one herb or anything as a crutch. So that's why it's good to have a good balance of everything and learn about as many different herbs and spices and foods that can heal the body as you can. All right, well, that's my this and that for the week. Thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.